Hi, listeners. I am so excited that you are joining me. I have an amazing guest with us today. Um, I have the one and only Miss um, Terry Cotman, who's going to be talking to us about Adlerian play therapy. So thank you for tuning in to this episode from the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. Um, my guess is you've heard of Terry before. If you have not, let me share a little bit about her bio with you, and then um, and then we're going to have a fun conversation. So, uh, Terry, in my world, you're a big deal. Uh, you're a, you're a big deal in the play therapy in the play therapy world. <laughs> You, you, you have, you've been a, a pioneer for, um, for this field. So Terry um, Common is the, the, the creator and um, developer of Adlerian Play Therapy. Um, you'll hear more about it um, as we get into this conversation, but um, she also founded the League of Extraordinary Adlerian Play Therapists. I mean, even the fact that you use the word extraordinary in there is like so unbelievably fun, uh, which is an organization that provides play therapy training and offers a certification program in Adlerian play therapy. So listeners, if you get excited as we go through this conversation, you know that's available to you. Um, Terry, you are a regular presenter. You've been presenting for years um, nationally and internationally. You, uh, you are an author. Um, I have down here 14, 14 books you've authored or edited. Uh, so, I mean, amazing. And then you have some pretty amazing um, achievements too. So in 2014, just want to say congratulations even before I say this. In 2014, um, Terry was granted a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association of Play Therapy. Congratulations to you. In 2017, you were given the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Iowa Association of Play Therapy. And in 2020, you received a third Lifetime Achievement Award from the North American Society for Adlerian um, Psychology. So you are a big deal, Terry Common. <laughs> don't think I, I, not my, not my mind. Don't know. <laughs> to a lot of therapists and thus a lot of the children they work with um, on behalf of all of them. Thank you. And, uh, and you're, you're a big deal to them. So, yes. Terry, anything else that you'd love for us to know, uh, know about you? Um, I think, I think my big accomplishment is that I've been married for 46 years and I'm still manly in love with my beloved. Oh, congratulations. And we, we raised a kid who's turned out to be pretty decent, Amazing. uh, which is also lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of, those are my bigger accomplishment. I figure staying married for that long. And still liking the person you're married to, this is um, a big deal. A lot of it's because Rick's a better person than I am. Um, he's calm and peaceful and doesn't get all. <sighs> <laughs> Terry, where is home for you? I live in Cedar Falls, Iowa, which is a kind of a medium to small city mm -hmm. in Iowa. Um we moved here partly, well, because I had a job, I had a job being a professor here for a while. And then, um, then I got promoted to full professor. So I quit mm -hmm. to start a play therapy training center. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I know that some of you might be um, just audio listening and are not able to, um, to see Terry and I right now. So for those of you that just have audio, um, Terry, I'm going to hold up your hands, Terry. Terry's hands are tie-dyed um, at the moment. You are oh, that's sharing, my that's my dad too. And uh, <laughs> and um, and you were sharing that you got to um, do some tie-dye uh, yesterday with um, with a young with a young girl. And so uh, I love this because Terry, this is my experience of you. I shared with you. I've been in some of your trainings before, and if I had one word to describe you, you're fun. Like you are so unbelievably fun and you're creative. And I pretty much laughed my way through um, the training with you. And so like you're over here with like your tie-dyed hands and all of that. And uh, it's just, uh, I wanted our audience that can just hear right now to have a, a visual of, of fun. <laughs> that's, that's happening on the screen right now. 
Well, a couple, a couple of, no, well, actually, this was probably like 10 or 15 years ago. I was tie-dyeing with some kids actually for some sessions because when I'm working with kids who are perfectionistic, one of the things I do with them is tie-dye. And at that point, my private practice was in our house. And so I was tie-dyeing in my kitchen and I had some extra dye left after they were gone. And I thought, I looked around my house and thought, what, what? else could I tie dye because I hate throwing dye which just down the sink and so I realized that the thing I had that I could tie dye was my granny panty underwear <laughs> and so I so I tie dyed my granny panty underwear and then I started saying to my friends you know if you're having a bad day and you go to the bathroom and you look down and you're wearing tie dye underwear it can't be a bad day and so I started tie-dyeing underwear for my friends mm -hmm. who were a little skeptical. And then my best friend is a judge mm -hmm. and she regularly texts me the underwear saved somebody five years in prison um, because it makes her day better. Yes. And so I started bringing tie-dye underwear to the play therapy conference. The year that yes. I got the one achievement award, yes. I was so uncomfortable being like the center of attention. Um, and not having like content to do, I thought I need to distract myself and distract other people. So I brought a suitcase filled with tie dye underwear. I I, I heard about this. this. I heard about this. I heard <laughs> you could get some fun tie dye underwear from Terry Cotman. <laughs> That's but what a lovely. I mean, it's so true. How do, how are you in a bad mood if you look down and you're wearing tie dye underwear? Like that's just fun. <laughs> Another weird thing I do, which Jacob, our son, gets so embarrassed by, is I read in a magazine a number of years ago that if you find a penny or a coin on the ground and it's face up, that that like makes people's days. Like that's one of the things that makes a difference in people's lives, which I was fascinated by. So I, every time I get change from a purchase, I see the world with coins and make sure they're face up mm. I was recently teaching in the Netherlands and I I had to have somebody show me what face up and face down was because I was scattering coins on the ground and one of my friends had not heard the story so she she was following me and she's like Terry I picked up all this money for you I'm like no 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 that's not we're leaving it <laughs> that's so great so Terry, I want to I want to uh, learn a little bit more about you, and I know our listeners probably do also. Um, what got you started in working with kids? Like, what what attracted you? What got you on the journey? And well, I was then... a special ed teacher. Mm -hmm. So I, my dad was a pediatrician, and so I worked in his office when I was in junior high and high school, and and taught swimming lessons in high school, and thought. I know I want to do something with kids mm -hmm. then. And um, so I got certified as a regular ed teacher. And I, can I say this? I sucked at it. I sucked at having 30 kids in my classroom, especially because my internship, I worked with sixth graders. And um, then I, I got married to Rick and moved to a different state and where he was still going to school. And I wasn't certified to teach there. And so I got a job being a paraprofessional in a special ed classroom for emotionally disturbed and um, behavior disordered kids. And I fell in love with that population. And so then I went and got, and got a second master's degree in special education and was a special ed education teacher in inner city Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I'm old. So it was, I'm about to be 70. And so it was um, before they had elementary counselors. So my children who, I had children who had been in like the state mental hospital and I had children who had stabbed our previous teacher, et cetera. I had some kids who were pretty hardcore and they were getting no psychological services whatsoever. And what I knew was behavior mod. And I was dissatisfied with behavior mod because I felt like it was teaching them to be externally motivated mm -hmm. rather than internally motivated. And I wanted to learn something else. Um, and so I started 
this is this is a really weird thing probably, but I was in my 20s and I love going to school. So I started shopping for a PhD program mm -hmm. that would teach me things that were different than what I'd learned already. And so um, I took classes in seven different programs mm -hmm. and eventually stumbled onto counselor education at the University of North Texas, which I did not realize at the time because I didn't know anything about play therapy. Um, but it was like kind of the, at that point, like the capital of play therapy training because um, Gary Landreth was there. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, did you get to study with Gary directly? Was, was your original training with Gary? Um, you may have to edit this out. <laughs> Um, he tells me to tell people that, that no, um, no, I didn't actually take play therapy from him. I did a, um, did a special topics with him mm -hmm. after I'd already started developing Andlerian play therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was weird circumstances. I was in a doctoral practicum mm -hmm. and I was doing Adlerian with adult clients and, very, very happy with it. And we had limited numbers of clients. And so one day the teacher came in and said, we have a new client. Uh, there's some difficulty because the new client lives in a children's home and somebody's going to have to go get her and bring her back to the clinic and do um, counseling with her. And at that point, point, it was an unwritten rule um, that you weren't allowed to work with the child if you hadn't had Gary's class. And at that point, he was the only person teaching um, play therapy. And by this time, I had moved to a junior high high school, special ed school. So I was mainly focusing on working with adolescents at this point. And um, so that's what I intended to be. But the teacher said, Terry, you have the most experience with younger children. So we're going to have an advanced doctoral student watch every single one of your sessions, um, go home over the weekend and read everything that's been written about play therapy. And wow. because this was a long time ago, there were limited books on play therapy, really. Mm -hmm. So I read Gary's Art of the Relationship. I read Dibs and Search of Self. I read Play Therapy by Axline. I read um, Window Store Children. I'm a fast reader. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I read a book by Haim Ganat on um, group play therapy. And I read a book by Moustakis on like existent what he called existential play therapy at that point. Um, it wasn't in the card catalog that TheraPlay was a thing. The TheraPlay by Andrew Burke had been written but I did not discover it until later. So all of the things I read were very non-directive, generally speaking, child-centered. And because Gary is the guru of, in the United States at least, child-centered play therapy, that was the expectation I was going to do. So, so Bridget, because I'm hearing, I'm hearing you paint this beautiful picture of like many worlds colliding, right? Like many different ideas, many different influences. You were studying Edlerian and loving it with your adults. So take us now into the world of Edlerian play, play therapy. Um, help us understand a little bit about what it is, how it came into, um, into your, your, your thinking. Take us, take us there. Um, well, Adlerian psychology was developed by Alfred Adler, who was a contemporary of Freud. He gets taught as somebody who was Freud's like uh, like acolyte. You can tell I was Catholic, raised Catholic, um, and uh, and so. But Adlerians believe that's not what happened. Adler was the first editor of the um, psychodynamic journal and was very unhappy with many of the things that Freud said because he believed that psychopathology was more based on people being discouraged and people striving for protect, um, perfection 
and not being able to achieve perfection and being stuck in their kind of feelings of not being enough. And then beginning to feel that they were inferior and then that was discouraging. So that was part of what he believed. He also believed that um, paying attention to people's families was really important. So he talked about the fact that you can't, you can't understand a client, whether it's an adult or a child. And he did not work with children, but he worked with families some. Um, that that you can't understand somebody without understanding the social context. Mm -hmm. And so part of what he talked a lot about is what we call family atmosphere, which is kind of the general affective tone of the family and how it's impacting everybody in the family, but especially children. He talked about birth order being really important. That's the things he's kind of famous for, if you will, are feelings of inferiority, and the superiority inferiority complexes mm -hmm. and then he's famous for the birth order kinds of things and um, so he talked about psychological birth order rather than actual birth order and that was very appealing to me he talked about how the the counselor's job is to give people an experience that's different than the experience they have with other people and to when people are acting as if their like uh, feelings of inferiority are true and their negative um, interpretations of things connected to self, the world and others are true. They are acting as if those things are true. Mm -hmm. And he said what the therapist's job is, is to give them an experience in which they can't reprove what they already believe about themselves, the world, and others. And I love that idea. That was um, that was super appealing to me. I love the idea that I didn't have to focus on, at the point that I was going through the program, there was a whole lot of emphasis on psychopathology. Um, and I didn't have to focus on the psychopathology. Adler... <laughs> Adlerians believed that Adler was the first of a lot of things, so that he was the first holistic therapist. He was the first, um, he was the first family therapist. He was the first positive psychologist, et cetera. But we whine about this a lot. We don't get credit for it. Mm -hmm. But all of those things really are true. If you look at, the, at what he wrote and you look at the time in which he wrote it, and then you look at as psychology has evolved and how and the other kind of branches of psychology there are strands from things that Adler said at one point um our Ellis said every modern approach to psychology with adults was um originating in Adler's work but that he was the only one who was giving Adler credit for that Mm. And so the Adler gets get pretty whiny about that. Mm. So I yeah, so you were clearly inspired by his work and it felt really meaningful for you. So what does it look like in the translation from a play therapy perspective? Help our so, so in a play therapy perspective, so traditionally before I developed Adler in play therapy, um Adlerians mainly worked with children only in the context of families. They did not work with children um, individually. And they made the assumption that children could talk about their problems just like grownups could or teens could. And I thought, you know, my experience in doing things with children at that point for like half my life um, that that kids did communicate through play. They did communicate through what Scott Riviere calls mechanical communication, what they do. And that felt super important to me. I'm the oldest of five kids. And um, my mom had a lot of mental health issues. And so I, I helped raise my brothers and my sister, basically. And so saw them when they were little, when they couldn't 
articulate what was going on with them, but they could show me when they played. So I started paying attention to that when I was pretty young. Yeah. And so I thought if I could meld the two, if I could meld thinking about children um, in Adlerian ways, but use play to um, communicate with them, that that would be an avenue for using children's kind of way they, they just naturally communicate, capitalizing on that. Adler said that at one point he said, play is not a trivial pursuit. It's the work of the child. Um, and that was like, he didn't work with kids and said that. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I wanted to do was integrate the two, mm -hmm. but I, but I needed to not, child center didn't fit my personality and didn't fit what I believe about people mm -hmm. to be child centered you have to believe that the three core conditions, empathic understanding, genuineness, and unconditional positive regard are necessary and sufficient. And I, for me, I don't believe for many children they're sufficient. Mm -hmm. I believe they're necessary, but I don't believe they're sufficient. So I needed to figure out a way to be myself in the playroom and not be an imitation of someone else because I felt like I was not being genuine when I was trying to be child-centered. And the, this, the, this little girl that I worked with gave me some pretty significant feedback when she said to me, how come you're not yourself in that room with the toys wow. and you're yourself in the car and in the hallway? It's like, uh, okay, wow. I got to figure this out. So I got to figure out how to take the uh, the strands of Adlerian and figure out a way to use them in the playroom. So in Adlerian play therapy, do you have what you would um, list out as the sort of core piece, like core tenets or core philosophy, like you just said with um, child-centered? Like, are there, are there these certain sort of pieces that at Larry and play therapists orient back to or, or come back to? Um, the, the primary one is encouragement. Uh -huh. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. And, um, you know, there are four phases in Adlerian psychology, which are the same four phases that I've just applied in Adlerian play therapy. And so in some ways, the tenants are relationship is super, super, super important, super, super important. But from an Adlerian perspective, it is not enough for many clients to move forward, that they need to um, have us understand what's going on with them, both their interpersonal dynamics and their intrapersonal dynamics. Mm -hmm. So we need to explore that. Mm -hmm. So that would be another kind of tenant exploring what Edlerians call lifestyle, which is like how they see themselves, how they see other people, how they see the world and how they act as if those things are true. So exploring that, and that's the second phase. Um, and so the third phase is helping them gain insight. Mm -hmm. And that's a little tricky, I think in the play therapy world, because we make a lot more guesses mm -hmm. about what's going on with the dynamics. So with the interpersonal dynamics, the intrapersonal dynamics, we make a lot of guesses mm -hmm. about that. And we try to do it on a developmental level. But one of the things we know about children is that generally speaking, their ability to understand things comes more quickly with most children than their ability to articulate it because their receptive vocabulary, their receptive um, ability to understand something quite frequently develops way more, like way earlier 
than their expressive abilities. And so we make a lot of guesses and, and that would, so, so it would be basically relationship, explore, insight, help get, get insight. And then um, the fourth kind of thing is that we need to teach skills. Mm -hmm. And so that would be the fourth phase, which is called reorientation, reeducation. So it's all about teaching anger management skills, teaching anxiety management skills, teaching friendship skills, et cetera, teaching communication skills, teaching problem solving skills, but using the play to do it and using stories. Mm -hmm. Adlerian play therapy is very big into stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that would like, in some ways, those are, those are both the tenants mm -hmm. and the phases, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, thinking of as if I was a listener and I, then this was all new for me. Um, and so my question from that perspective is, so is Adlerian always directive or, or are there other pieces where it's not directive? That's a question that a, list, a listener might have. This is, a, this is the, the trickiest one. So the answer is it's both. And, and it's both in, um, it's both, this is, this is the art of Adlerian play therapy rather than the science of Adlerian play therapy. I have a lot of things that I could tell you. This is how you know this with the directive versus non-directive piece, how, so it's partly dependent on phase. Mm -hmm. It's partly dependent on the presenting problem and the lifestyle of the client. Mm -hmm. And it's partly depending on the lifestyle of the therapist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the first phase is the least directive mm -hmm. because we, want to establish the, the relationship, at least the beginning of the relationship, given the fact that we are going to build a relationship the whole time. But that initial building the relationship piece is non-directive for the most part. But we say to the kid the first session or two, I say this to children, both the first session and the second session, sometimes in here you get to be the boss and sometimes I get to be the boss, or sometimes we'll do things that you want to do, and sometimes we'll do things that I want to do. So I established that from the very beginning. And then the second phase is about probably 50-50. Um, a lot of times you can explore the dynamics without being directive, because the kids are going to show you who they are, yes. just by the way they interact with you, by the way you see them interacting with their siblings. I volunteer one day a week at a school. And so the way I see kids in the hallway, the way I see kids in their classroom, et cetera, tells me a huge amount about the child and they're both intrapersonal dynamics and interpersonal dynamics. And I will ask them to do some things. When we are directive in Adlerian play therapy, we try to custom design that, which means if we've got a child who likes to do art, we'll do art. If we've got a child who likes to do puppet shows, we'll do puppet shows. If we've got a child who likes to play basketball games, we'll ask them to do some things in the context of basketball, et cetera. So we custom design it based on what their interests are and based on how they best like to express themselves. You know, it's so um, beautiful you're saying that because as you keep talking, you haven't said this word yet, but I keep hearing the word authenticity as you're, as you're talking, um, I just, uh, just, it just, it just feels like it's part of what you're saying. So correct me if I'm wrong, that there's a piece of just the authenticity of the clinician and the authenticity of the client. And that that's also part of the, the dance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so and respect. Picking up on that. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. it's authenticity and it's respect mm -hmm. because I want to be respectful to the client. Mm -hmm. And what that means when you're playing with a kid is I want to be, if I've got a kid who's interested in video games, then, and, and say it's a kid who's playing Fortnite or say the kid is really excited about Overwatch 2, mm -hmm. then I go online and watch people on Twitch doing Overwatch 2 so I can know what the dynamics of that game are, et cetera. I, so, and that's to me is 
both authenticity because I get super excited about it because they're excited about it, mm -hmm. but also respect because I, if I am knocking on the door and saying, can I come into your world? Yeah. Then I need to be respectful about their world. Yeah. And, and I, the other, I guess, word that I would say is a word that I would describe other and play therapy is, is intentional. Mm. We are very intentional with what we do. And, and that I work really hard to teach people to be intentional. So the third phase quite frequently is, I'm going to finish answering that other yeah. question yeah. since I lost it at one point. Um, the, the third phase is, um, it's, it depends on how you define directive, mm -hmm. um, but it's very interpretive. So it's very making guesses. We would call that meta communication, which is communication about the communication mm -hmm. and communication about what we think is the underneath of what's going on. So we would make a lot of guesses about that. Um, Adlerians call those tentative hypotheses and we call them spitting in the client soup. <laughs> Kind of a gross phrase. But one of the things Adler said is if you go to a restaurant and you look over and you see the waiter spitting in the bowl of soup that's intended for your table, you would be less likely to want to eat it than you would if he hadn't spat in the soup. And so we will compassionately, gently, lovingly point out things that the child is doing that get in their own way. Yeah. So if I have a child who is having difficulty making friends and really wants friends, and I see that um, if he doesn't get his way playing on the playground or whatever, that he leaves in a huff, then I'm going to point out, you know, if, if you want to make friends, you might have to be willing to play what other people want to play sometimes. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Yeah. So that's, and we do a lot of storytelling mm -hmm. and we co-tell stories, but we also design therapeutic metaphors for children who are metaphor children. Mm -hmm. um, and that's from, uh, from the perspective of um, the book by uh, Lori Yasnak and Ken Gardner, the, the dimensions model of play therapy, that would be considered to be directive, even though we're not saying to the kid, I'd like you to draw a picture, or um, would you be willing to do a puppet show or whatever, that's still, by their definition, at least, is directive, as in I'm saying to the kid, hey, I made a book for you this weekend, and I'd like to read it to you, or I have a little puppet show I want to um, do for you. Um, would you be willing to, like, sit and be my audience? So those are also directive. Um, and then in the third phase, the fourth phase is the most directive because that's the teaching phase, the teaching and practicing phase. So I might say to a kid, um, let's pretend that I am a person who wants to be, that, that you would like me to be your friend. And um, I'm on the playground. So what would you say if you came over? So we do a lot of role playing kinds of things. I do a lot of board game things to, to work on social skills, to work on taking turns, to work on um, frustration tolerance, to work on um, uh, like uh, being able to tolerate not always winning or not always getting your way. I do a lot of things with that. I do a lot of, again, storytelling for the child that's designed to teach. Um, and so that's the most directive phase. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, people, people who like an answer to things, like one right answer, Adlerian play therapy sometimes drives them nuts because our answer, all of the teachers who teach for us, the LEPT teachers and myself, the answer in many cases is it depends. It depends. <laughs> now we're going to tell you what it depends on. So I'm going to say, you know, it depends. It depends on um, how the kid's week's gone this week. It depends on how the family deals with conflict. It, I mean, so I know what it depends on, but um, sometimes that's super frustrating for people who want a 
here's how you do, here's, here's the way you do this. And you do this with every single child because we never do anything with every single child. So I took a class on Friday on superheroes from um, Sophia, I'm sorry. And it was a great, it was a great class. And I learned some really cool techniques, but I'm going to go to my school where I volunteer tomorrow. I'm not going to do all those techniques with all the kids that I work with because they're not appropriate for all the kids that I work with. I might do one of the techniques with one of those kids because it would be appropriate with him. So I think that's, that's an important thing to, to, um, to know about Adlerian play therapy is that we are constantly thinking about what I call the big A agenda and the small A agenda. The big A agenda is where we're, where are we going with this client? So what are our big objectives? And then our small A agenda is a plan for the session. And one of the things I teach my students is never get attached to the small A agenda because you go in and you have this brilliant, beautiful story that you've crafted for this child. And then they got in a fight on the playground. Right. And it, the story is not about getting a fight on the playground or conflict management. The story is about self-esteem. And then I think, OK, that's not going to work today. Similarly, not going to work today. And so in that case, say it's a fourth phase, like we're in fourth phase, I'm going to go back to first phase. I'm going to go back to, yeah. okay, you just need support here. You just need encouragement here. You're feeling really frustrated and um, you didn't use any of those skills <laughs> that you learned that you usually use. And today was just a really rough day. And so one of the things that it's hard to teach in some ways, when you've got phases, because our phases are not discrete. They overlap, they segue into one another. Um, every once in a while, you know, in a first session, I started with a new kid last week and I thought, ooh, 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 this kid thinks he's too weird for people to like him. And so I said, you know, a lot of people think I'm pretty weird. And I have a lot of friends. I did not say this, and you have that same issue. I just kind of threw it in there, which would be a fourth phase metaphoric intervention. And it was the first time I met the kid, but I wanted to plant that seed and it came up. Yeah. You're describing such a beautiful um, uh, way for therapists to attune at a much larger level, much larger level, not just a tune like in the moment, but like a tune in the entire treatment process, like real it, meta a tune. Is that a word? I don't know. Right. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, right, but, but it's kind of like, that. I'm just hearing like this, like meta attunement, you know, on multiple, on multiple levels and multiple scales. It's really, it's really quite beautiful the way you're, you're, you're describing it. Super cool. When I read The Mindful Play Therapist by Dan Siegel the first time, I was so like, oh, attunement and resonance, attunement, attunement and resonance. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, I made all of the teachers that work for LEP read, read, the book. read that book yeah. because I'm like, okay, so this is what we're doing. Yeah. And they were like, oh, yeah, we get it. Yeah. The, the, the left brain language, right? For this like intuitive process. <laughs> Yes. Um, so um, I have another another question that I want to ask, but before that, for the individuals that are curious about um, your work and about where they can do some trainings, can we just drop in? What's the website? Where can where can um, they go? The, so there are two websites. This is a little complicated. There's a there's a, a informational website, which is www w however many w's it is at larianplaytherapy.com mm -hmm. that's oh that's the website that describes the certification program it describes what Adlerian play therapy is basically it's also got a link for financial aid because we rick and i um fund financial aid for people who are interested in learning Adlerian play therapy one of the things we decided a couple of years ago is that our our child did not need to inherit a lump sum of money because he's he's not the most fiscally responsible person in the world. He would tell you this. And um, so so we are um, 
what we decided we wanted to do with our money is we wanted to support people who wanted to learn and learn play for people who couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a super big deal to us. So there's information on that website, www.andlearningplaytherapy.com. And then there's another website, which is the website for the registration. And it's got a list of all the classes and things. And that is, what is it, Terry? <laughs> she loved that one. It's, okay. it's <laughs> HTTP. Lept, L-E-A-P-T, which stands for, and it's all lowercase, it stands for the League of Extraordinary Unlearning and Play Therapists, dot Arlo. Arlo is the registration system we use. Mm -hmm. Great. Beautiful. Um, well, my, my, my last question as we're wrapping up this discussion, because, um, I mean, you've really seen the growth of our field and have seen how things have um, evolved. What, um, what advice would you give to therapists that are, I, I don't even just want to say starting out, but just like at this point with everything that you've seen, right. And, and you, you sense, you know, where growth is and where things are stuck and all of that. Like, what's your, this is what I want to say to play therapists right now with, with your understanding. You know, I think it's really important. I think it's really important to have a theoretical orientation. Um, I, there's a trend kind of for prescriptive or integrative play therapy. This is kind of an editorial comment, I guess. Um, and sometimes that feels like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Mm -hmm. A little of this, a little of that, a little of this, a little of that. Right, but without any systematic way to conceptualize the client. Mm -hmm. I think it's super, super, super important to be intentional and to be consciously planful about what you're doing with your clients. And I think in order to do that, you need to have a systematic way to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. And that systematic way to conceptualize needs to be based on your philosophical beliefs about how people get the way they are, and how people change. And so I think people need to be discerning um, when, they're, when they're thinking about getting trained as play therapists and look at what does this particular approach, what's it based on? What, what are the beliefs in this particular approach to play therapy? So if I were a new play therapist, I would be looking at what does Lisa say about synergistic play therapy and how it helps people change? What does Gestalt play therapy say about how people get the way they are and how people change and how, where is the congruence between what I believe about how people get the way they are and how they change and this particular approach to play therapy? Totally. Um, I just think that's super important. Uh -huh. And um, I get a lot of, uh, for a while, I was doing a lot, a lot, a lot of play therapy supervision. I'm semi-retired now, so I actually am not anymore. I have, I have people in left that do that now. Um, but I would get people saying to me, oh, would you do supervision with me? Because I've taken all these classes at the APT conference and I know a whole lot of techniques and I don't really know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, and, and I loved that they recognize that. Mm -hmm. Even, and even if you don't want to choose a theory or even if you want to um, meld two different theories that are compatible um, philosophically, I still think you need to have a systematic way of conceptualizing. So if you're making up the way you do play therapy, have a consistent way to think about kids and think about families and think about how people change. Like we don't work with a kid if we can't get some buy-in from some adult in the kid's life. Mm -hmm. That's one of our basic things in Adlerian play therapy. Um, but if you don't think that's important, then Adler and play therapy wouldn't be a good match for you. There are a lot of approaches to play therapy that don't think that's important. Choose one of them. Yeah. 
I so love what you're saying. There's so much permission in what you're saying for play therapists to go, go find yourself, you know, like go, go find yourself in a, in a theory. Um, but I think, I mean, I know in my journey, I just learned what, what I was exposed to in whatever classes, uh, classes I took at the time. And uh, it took me going out on my own outside of the, what I was just naturally exposed to, to, to look at, well, what is this? And what is this? And what is this? And what is this? And I think what you're saying is so, um, so perfectly necessary um, for a therapist to go discover who they are, but get grounded in something, choose something that's you and get grounded in it. And then, yeah, that just feels, there. I mean, that feels like the most important thing, truthfully. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are super focused on technique. Mm-hmm. And not particularly focused on why are we doing this? Yeah. I think you ought to know. Why are you doing stuff? Why are you doing stuff with this particular kid? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Terry, this has been just a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful for your time. And uh, I feel inspired talking to you. I know our listeners are um, jazzed listening to you and knowing a bit more about you as well. Uh, thank you for what you have done in the field, what you continue to do in the field. I said at the beginning that 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 you're a big deal, and um, and you were humble enough to say, "Well, I don't I don't know about that," but Terry, you are a big deal, and uh, and I just want to say thank you, really, truly, thank you for um, for for being who you are in the field for um, for us. So, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Listeners, uh, you know where to go and um, learn more about um, Terry and her work and Adlerian Play Therapy. And as always, wherever you are in the world, I invite you to take a moment, take a breath, reflect, remind yourself that um, you're the most important toy in the playroom and your well being matters a lot. So take care of yourself and until next time. <laughs>